select an audio object and double click to open the object editor. This is the default view and it's split into three sections divided by tabs. We have the Object Effects tab, the Position Fades tab, and the Pitch Shifting Time Stretching tab. There is also a mini view showing just the essentials. Ticking Max opens the maximized view. This gives you access to all of the object editor parameters in one window. It's important to understand that every audio object inherently has its own object editor. You can have one object editor for one complete length of audio, or you can chop that longer piece of audio into shorter clips and process those individual clips. You can then enjoy real-time FX processing using discrete object editors. No rendering is required. The beauty of this is that CPU processing of the object effects will only take place when that object is playing. I will be showing you some examples of this real-time processing and the power that it affords in this series of videos. For this guided tour, I will be using the object editor mainly in tabbed mode. Parts 1 to 7 will show the functions related to the object effects tab. Parts 8 to 16 will explain the position fades tab. Then parts 17 to 19, the pitch shifting time stretching tab. Place the play cursor and press T to split the object. That original 8 bar audio object has now been divided into 4 shorter objects of 2 bars in length. Each object has now been assigned its own dedicated object editor. I'm going to rename those objects. I'm using the double arrows to navigate between them. Selecting an object updates the editor so it becomes active for that object. As I switch between objects, the object name is shown on the object editor title bar. Click the play stop button to play from the current cursor position. You can of course use the spacebar to play and stop. Play solo will play only selected objects. Turning on loop mode and pressing play solo will cycle that selected object. Pressing Ctrl plus spacebar will enable the play solo status as well. Notice also that during playback the PL button turns blue. This indicates that playback of that object is in progress. I'm now going to give you a detailed guide to the features relating to the Object Effects tab. To begin with we have the Gain Control. This lets you cut or boost the gain of the selected object. You can either left click and drag or use the mouse wheel to make adjustments. Or type in a value in the text box. Double clicking within the frame resets it to zero. Below that there are two auxiliary sends. Send1 has been routed to the very verb, and Send2 is routed to the Ecox delay. Notice that as I turn up the auxiliary sends for this object, that the auxiliary channel metering to the left is showing this increase in level. Clicking on the Edit button reveals extended aux send capabilities. Filtox and Corvex are now disclosed as the third and fourth sends. As I open up these sends, the on box becomes ticked to show these are active. You can also untick these boxes to turn off the respective sends. There's also a bypass all tick box which bypasses all the sends of course. Also, notice the tick box is named Visible. These define which two effects sends will show in the object editor. At the moment, Variverb and Ecox are showing, but if I tick Filtox and Corvex, they become the visible effects sends instead. 
Pressing the pan button gives you extended pan settings for each auxiliary send. This includes a panorama knob and below you can edit the amount of center channel damping. To the right of that is a stereo width control with a range from mono to enhanced. To the right of that are check boxes which affect left and right positioning and phase. There are also some useful presets in the drop down menu. To add extra buses, click on the New AUX Bus button. This will create new AUX buses in the mixer and activate new AUX sends for the object editor. You can have up to 8 sends per page. When you add the ninth, a new page opens to accommodate a further 8 sends. You can keep adding extra sends until the limit of 64 AUX buses is reached. To navigate between these pages, use the left and right double arrow. There's also a Reset AUX Sends button which turns off all the sends for that object. Finally, notice the info panel showing how many AUX buses are being used in the project. The currently active object AUX Sends are displayed as well. Click OK to confirm. The extra auxiliary buses I added are now showing in the mixer. It's then a matter of inserting some plugins and using the extra sends from within the object editor. Next up is the plugins section. You can add up to six plugins from the main interface. This includes all the Magix plugins plus any third party DirectX or VST effects you may have. It's important to understand how plugins are categorized in Samplitude and Sequoia at this time. So as to make things clearer, I'm going to divide the plugins into two categories. Category 1 is FX Inserts. These are the Magic's internal plugins which include the FFT Filter, EQ116, Multiband Dynamics, Vocoder, Room Simulator, and SMAX11 to name a few. They all have a silver grey look to them. These are not VST plugins, which is why I've given them a separate category. These FX inserts always appear in the upper half of the submenu list. The second category is VST plugins. These include all of the Sasha Eversmeyer Magix VST plugins like Ecox, Corvex, Filtox, Ammunition, and Vandal, plus the EFX series. Magix VST plugins always show up in the lower half of the submenu list. However, the EFX plugins are situated between the FX inserts and the Magix VST plugins. I hope you're keeping up. This second category of plugins also includes third party DirectX and VST effects. The main plugin menu is also split into two halves. The top half is just for the Magix plugins and they are grouped by FX type for easy access. The bottom half shows just the VST DirectX type plugins. There's also a menu to open the VST DirectX rewire setup page. These plugin slots are the most immediate and convenient method for adding object effects. You can mix and match both categories of plugins from here. Just to make things clear, Category 1 plugins refers to FX inserts. These are the internal FX created by Magix in Dresden, Germany. They have a silver grey interface. Category 2 plugins refers to Magix VST plugins created at Magix Berlin by Sasha Eversmeyer. This category also includes any third party DX VST plugins. So when I refer to DX VST plugins, that will also include Sasha's plugins as well. So hopefully that's clarified things. Six plugin slots is probably adequate in most cases. Although if you do need more, click on the edit button to the right of where it says plugins. This opens the plugin configuration page. This window is for managing these category two VST plugins. Click on the Add Plugin button to add more. You can load and save your plugin chains by clicking on the Load Save buttons. 
they are given the file extension PLG. You can also load your saved plugin chains by clicking on the downward arrow to select from the list. In comparison to track effects presets, there is a slight difference in functionality when saving object effects presets. With objects, you can only save VST plugin chains. You cannot save category 1 FX inserts as a plugin chain, neither can you save a mix of FX inserts and VST plugins as a chain. I'm sure this situation will be remedied in a future update. I'm going to load one of these VST plugin chains now. In this case, they are the Magix VST plugins. This chain comprises of five plugins, but as you can see, only three are open. The two EFX plugins are not showing at the moment. If I select the EFX phaser and click edit, it opens. Same with the EFX stereo delay, click edit to open. Disable the plugin by either unticking the checkbox or clicking the on off button. You can change the order of the plugins by using the up and down arrows. You can also switch a plugin from pre fader to post fader. Click on the downward arrow until it moves to post fader and vice versa. Use bypass all to bypass all of the plugins. If you want to remove a plugin, select the plugin and press the delete button. The force latency box lets you put in your own value, but this only works for some DirectX plugins. Below this is a force mono processing tick box. To the right of that is the setup button, which takes you to the DirectX VST setup page. Here you can define your VST plugin directory and activate rewire. From here, you can also load save plugin buffer presets. The text boxes below let you customize your own presets. To unload the entire plugin chain, you have a couple of choices. I've created an empty preset which I can select from the list. Selecting this preset removes all of the plugins, although this only works with the VST plugin chains. I'll close that window for now. The conventional method for unloading all categories of plugins is to click the FX Routing button. At the bottom where it says FX Settings, to the right click Reset. I'm reloading that preset and returning to the main object editor window. Here you can turn the first six FX on or off by using the buttons next to the plugin slots. You can turn off all the effects by deselecting the On button at the bottom. And finally, clicking on Edit next to the plugin opens the plugin GUI. For this part, I'm going to start by focusing on the Category 1 plugins. I'm also going to show you how they are managed in comparison to VST plugins. I'm leaving the VST plugins inserted for this example. Category 1 plugins are the Silver Grey Magix native insert effects. Any plugin can be opened by left clicking on the downward arrow of the plugin slots. When there is a horizontal dividing line, Category 1 insert effects will always appear in the top half. I'll open one now. Notice that the newly added FX insert is now at the top of the list. FX inserts are always by default placed before VST effects. Another way to add insert effects is by clicking on the FX routing button. Use this window to rearrange the FX order. You can then save this as a routing preset. But you can also turn Category 1 insert effects on and off in this window. To do this, click on the plus sign next to FX inserts to expand the submenu. You will now see a list of these FX inserts and they can be turned on or off by using the tick box. At the time of making this video, it's only possible to move the Magix internal FX inserts as a group. Unlike VST effects, you can't change the actual order of individual FX inserts at this time. The exception to this rule is the Dynamics, Distortion, Equalizer and Legacy Delay Reverb. The individual position of these four effects can be changed. 
When I close the window, you will see the effects I just turned on have been added to the FX slots of the object editor. As I mentioned earlier, the default is to place FX inserts above DX VST plugins. You can change this order by clicking on the FX routing button again. Select DX VST plugins, prefader in this case, then use the arrows to reposition this plugin group above the FX insert plugins. You can then save this as a routing preset if you want to. Now when I close the window, you will see that the VST plugins have been given priority in the plugin slot order. By the way, if you double click on the DX VST entry, it takes you directly to the VST configuration window. You can also switch between the plugin window and the FX routing window using the tabs on the left. You may have noticed there are two ways to access these configuration windows from within the object editor. One way is to use the FX routing button which takes you directly to the FX routing window. Clicking the plugins tab takes you to the VST configuration window. The other way is to press the plugins edit button to go directly to the VST configuration window. Clicking the routing tab takes you to the FX routing page. So these are essentially the same windows only the route to them is different. I felt it was important to explain the differences between Magic's FX inserts and VST plugins, especially how they interact within the object editor. Anyway, I'm hoping this has somehow clarified the situation for you. To the right of the plugin slots is the stock 4 band EQ. Clicking on the edit button will open the EQ GUI. To the right of that is the pan mute invert section. Pan uses the 0 dB pan law by default. Turning the stereo knob to the left collapses the image into a mono signal. Turning it to the right gives you enhanced stereo. Ticking the left-right box reverses the stereo image. Click on Edit to access the different pan options. The top section features the same controls as the main object editor, including 0 dB pan law for balance plus stereo enhancement. Alternatively, you can use the minus 4.5 dB pan law setting plus stereo enhancement. Clicking on two channel panorama gives you left and right controls for narrowing or widening the stereo image. Clicking on two-channel volume lets you adjust the left and right levels of a stereo signal. You can also access the EQ and pan controls by right-clicking over any of the knobs. Below that are invert and mute tick boxes. Then you have the volume fader with reset and normalize buttons. Double clicking on the fader resets it to zero as well. To the right of that you can change sample and background color using the color chooser. Below that are lock, FX bypass and freeze tick boxes. Ticking the lock checkbox 
locks the selected objects based on the lock object definitions. A diagonal line appears on the object to show this is activated. To access these definitions, press Y and go to the Lock Object Definitions tab. Bypass FX bypasses all enabled object effects, of course. Ticking the Freeze checkbox will freeze the currently selected object and remove all of the plugins. Here's an example. I'll add an FX chain. Now when I tick the Freeze checkbox, the entire FX chain is frozen. The object editor settings have been rendered into a new audio object. Unticking the Freeze checkbox reverses the freeze process and restores the plugin settings. Freezing includes all object editor settings except auxiliary sends. The To All button, when active, copies the settings of the first selected object to all other selected objects. I will be covering this function in greater detail in another tutorial. Below that are copy and paste icons. Use these to transfer settings from one object to another. Below that is the FX routing button which I mentioned earlier. I showed you the play stop and play solo buttons. Object name lets you edit the name of the object of course. If multiple objects are selected, you can give them all the same name by clicking on the To All button. I'm typing in the text box, clicking the To All button. Now the selected objects have all the same name. The left and right arrows are for selecting the next or previous objects. So that more or less covers everything related to the Object Effects tab. The second tab is called Position Fades. The first column is called Position Length. The four boxes display information relevant to the selected object. The first box shows the object start position. The second box the object length. The third box shows the object end position. The fourth box the wave start position. Use the corresponding left and right arrows to do the following. Object start will nudge the object start position either way. The nudge step setting determines the nudge value. You can change this setting by left clicking where it says bars beats. Choose a preset from the bottom. The nudge value is currently set to 1 8 or 192 ticks. Clicking and dragging changes the value in single step increments. Holding down control while dragging moves the value in 10 step increments. You can also use the up and down arrows of your computer keyboard or you can type in the amount. You can also nudge multiple objects. First, control select the desired objects, then click the left and right object start arrows. The object length arrows change the length of the object from the left edge. If I click the right arrow, the object gets shorter. If I click the left arrow, it gets longer. However, the total length will be limited to the finite length of the audio clip. This clip is 8 bars in length. Consequently, once the physical beginning of the object is reached, continued clicking of the left arrow will no longer have any effect. The same rule applies when using object end. Clicking the left arrow will shorten the object from the right edge. Click the right arrow to lengthen it. Likewise, as soon as the end is reached, continue clicking of the right arrow will have no effect. You can, of course, resize objects using the object handles. There's also an extended list of keyboard shortcuts for nudging and resizing objects. So, as is normal, you have a few workflow options. Clicking the wave start arrows nudges the waveform left or right. This is sometimes known as slip editing. Currently this does nothing as the whole 8 bars of the wave is showing. Consequently there's nowhere for the audio to nudge to. This situation changes as soon as I shorten the object. Here's an example. Change the object start length by clicking on the object length right arrow. 
also the object end length by clicking the left arrow. The overall object length is now two bars shorter. However, the length of the original wave within remains at eight bars. The difference is visual because I have resized the object. This is the basis of virtual editing. Although an object can be resized, the original audio is never changed, just hidden. In this case, two bars worth. This means that now when I click the wave start arrows, it's possible to nudge the waveform left or right by a total of two bars. Keep in mind that when a waveform has been nudged in this way, if the object is then resized to its original length, the start position of the object will have changed as well to accommodate the new wave position. In this case, the audio has been nudged two bars to the right. Now when I resize the object, the total object length has shifted to the right by that amount. I'll move it back to its original position. Here's another example of the virtual editing possibilities. If I split the object twice to make three virtual audio objects, now if I select the middle object, I can nudge the waveform back and forth using the wave start arrows. This creates an offset of that particular audio clip. Returning to the Nudge Steps box, use this for defining how fine or coarse you want to make these adjustments. Left clicking to the right of that box gives you a drop down menu where you can choose your Nudge format. As you can see there are all the possible formats that you should need. Regardless of what format you choose you will always find some handy presets at the bottom. Bars and beats, feet and frames, CD MSF, or you can input your own values. I'm using bars and beats for this tutorial. If I choose the finest preset resolution of 164th, you can see that comes out as 24. Following this logically means that 12 would be the equivalent of 1 128th note, and 6 the equivalent of 1 256th of a whole note. For an even finer resolution, you can always choose samples, and clicking on the list again gives you some presets at the bottom. Notice that when I choose a new format, the position and length columns also change to that format. You can also change the format by clicking to the right of any of the position length boxes. So that covers the position length section. To the right of the position length column is the fade in, fade out editor. You can adjust the object fade by dragging the left and right object handles. If I move the handles by any amount, the tooltip will update to show the current value. When the handle is released, the value appears in the corresponding text box above the Fade Preview window. You can also type in your own values as well. Incidentally, if you find that the tooltip isn't showing, press Y and click the General tab. Under Program Settings, there is a tick box called Show Project Tooltips. Make sure that is enabled. You can also activate Extended Tooltips below that. Left click on the drop down menu if you want to change the fade display format. Since moving the fade handles, you can see that the waveform has been scaled to reflect the fade setting. Waveform scaling can be deactivated by pressing Shift plus Tab to open the view options, then untick Scale with Fades Curves. Deactivating this means that although the fade curve is still active, it won't affect the waveform's size. I personally prefer to keep that setting turned on. 
The default fade curve is linear, but this can be changed by left clicking the fade menu buttons. The left menu deals with fades for the object's left edge. The right menu, the object's right edge. You can choose preset fades from these menus. Linear is the currently active preset. Below that we have Exponential, Logarithmic, Cosine, and Sine presets. The faders are for making fine adjustments to these preset curve shapes. You can also use the Curve Text input box to type in values. Alternatively, use the keyboard's up and down arrows or click and drag to make adjustments. Double clicking on the fader resets the fade to linear. Double clicking again returns the fader to the previous setting. Clicking Reset removes the fade. Simply drag the fade handles to restore the fade. Fade offsets provide a way to adjust the crossfade between adjacent objects. I will explain the different settings in this part and show practical examples in part 12. If you open either of the menus again, there are three presets. These are Fade Inside, Fade Symmetrical, and Fade Outside. Fade Inside gives you a fade offset of 0%. The Fade Outside preset gives you a fade offset of 100%. Fade Symmetrical gives you a 50% offset. These presets apply the setting to the left and right fade of the selected object. Notice the Fade Offset settings are also reflected in the Fade Offset text box. You can also type in your own settings or click and drag to adjust the offset percentage for individual left and right fades. The fade offset is represented by a green vertical dotted line in the fade preview window. This preview window represents the object and the green dotted line shows the fade offset relative to that object. If I set it to 0%, the line goes to the edge of the window. This means the fade will always be inside the object edge. This can also be selected from the menu under Fade Inside. If I move the fade handle, the fade will be placed completely inside the object borders. To use any offset higher than 0%, there has to be some audio beyond the visible object border. This is the same situation as I explained in the Audio Slip Editing section. As the whole object is visible, attempting to set any offset value beyond 0% will have no effect. As an example, if I make a fade offset of 25%, type in the value or just left click and drag to make a setting, the left side of the green vertical dotted line in the preview window represents that 25% offset. But because the entire audio object is showing and there is no spare audio beyond the object boundary, Adjusting the object fade handles will have no effect. To deal with this, I'm adjusting the object length so it's one beat shorter. Now we have some extra audio to use for the offset. As a result, moving the fade handle this time has the desired effect. Since moving the fade handle, there are two things to note. Firstly, the vertical indicator line at the second beat of the bar. This line separates the offset percentages. Where the fade dissects this vertical line, 25% will be to the left of that line and 75% to the right, same as is shown in the preview window. So this represents a fade offset of 25%. The fade will always retain that offset percentage relative to the vertical line. 
A 50% offset is also known as a symmetrical fade and is called fade symmetrical in the preset list. When I select this preset, the vertical indicator line updates to this new value. Also, the preview window now reflects this offset. Now when I move the handle, the fade pivots exactly at 50% either side of the vertical line. If I set a 100% offset or fade outside when selected from the preset list, the vertical line has again adjusted to this new value. Now the fade is 100% outside of the object edge. You can, of course, input any offset value between 0 and 100 by typing in or click dragging in the fade offset text box. Notice that as the offset value changes, the vertical line follows to reflect that new offset. So hopefully you can now understand how all these elements interact when using offsets. In the next part, I will show you some practical examples. In this part, I will elaborate on the use of crossfades. I will also show you how to exchange wave files on a per object basis. I'm splitting the object at bars 3, 4 and 5. Before doing this, make sure you have auto crossfade mode activated. Press T to split the objects. To make this more interesting, I'm going to swap out some of the audio. Control select objects 2 and 4. Now click on the folder icon to navigate to the folder directory. I have another 4 bar drum loop which I am selecting. I am now presented with a change reference to project dialog box. In this case I am choosing selected objects. Now the audio has been replaced for objects 2 and 4. The current fade offset is 0% or fade inside. If I pull the fade handle to the right, the crossfade stays completely within the selected object. If you want to crossfade between several objects, try this. Make sure the last three objects are selected. Now hold down the Alt modifier and move one of the fade handles to the right. The fade will now be applied to all of those objects. If I decide to set a fade offset of say 35%, you can see that 35% of the fade begins within the left object and the other 65% within the right object. Note you can still see the vertical indicator line in the background. To apply the same crossfade to multiple objects, try this. Control select the required objects, then input the crossfade offset value. But this time press the To All button. The crossfade offset has now been applied to all selected objects. Then hold down the Alt modifier and move one of the fade handles. If I choose Fade Symmetrical from the menu, you can now see we have a symmetrical fade between the two objects. If you want to make a symmetrical fade between all four objects, make sure the last three objects are selected, then choose Fade Symmetrical from the left menu. Now press the To All button to transfer the fade to all selected objects. Next, hold down the Alt modifier and pull one of the fade handles to the right. So now we have equal symmetrical fades between all four objects. You can of course change the crossfade shape to suit. 
If you want to use the same curve on multiple objects, the two all button will achieve this as well. Make sure the required objects are selected. The current selection is fine. I want to add an exponential fade to the left edge of these three objects. Choose the preset from the left menu. Then press the to all button to transfer the fade. Now deselect the last object and select the first object. I'm doing this to avoid putting a fade at the end of the last object. Remember to use the control modifier when selecting. Choose the preset from the right menu, then again press the to all button. You can make fine adjustments to the preset fade by using the faders. Using the mouse wheel moves the values in increments of 10. Using shift plus the mouse wheel gives you increments of 1. Clicking and dragging the fader works in a similar fashion. You can type in the amount if you prefer, or use the up and down arrows of your computer keyboard. Again, use the to all button if you want to transfer the new settings to all selected objects. To move all the crossfades at once, select the last object and deselect the first. Grab the handle at the bottom of the vertical line while holding down the Alt modifier. Now you can move the crossfades of all selected objects to a new position. To move individual crossfades, use the same method but without the modifier. Here's a simple example showing how to crossfade between multiple objects using different volume levels. This gives you a smooth transition between the volume changes. This time I'm splitting the object up into eight parts. By the way, make sure you have auto crossfade mode enabled. You can turn it on by clicking on the toolbar icon. I'm selecting all objects except the first one. The last object is already selected. Hold down the shift modifier and select the second object. Now all objects in between will be selected as well. Click on the left fade in menu and select fade symmetrical. Then press the to all button to transfer that fade setting to all selected objects. Next, grab one of the fade handles and pull to the right while holding down the alt modifier. So now we can adjust the fades of all these objects at once. Next I'm going to deselect every other object by CTRL left clicking. As I pull down one volume handle, the other selected objects move as well. So now there's a nice smooth transition between objects of alternating volumes. There are two more presets which are unique to the left menu. These are Allow Crossfade to the left and Asymmetric Crossfade to the left. I'm choosing Allow Crossfade to the left first. Doing this removes the crossfade between the two objects, leaving the right object with a fade curve to the left. When using this preset it's best to disable Auto Crossfade mode. Click on the icon to disable. I'm going to move the crossfade for the left object. So now when I move the crossfade for the right object, they both remain linked. You can of course adjust the fades to suit. I'm choosing the sign preset from the left menu. Selecting the left object and clicking on the right menu. I'm choosing logarithmic for that object. Make another adjustment. The second menu item is asymmetric crossfade to the left. 
This lets you adjust the left crossfade independently. Notice the crossfade of the neighboring object remains unaffected. So these two special left menu items add some extra flexibility when it comes to using crossfades. If you go to the fade menu again, you will see at the bottom there are two settings. Get global crossfade and set global crossfade. To set the global crossfade, do the following. Choose the fade offset you want to use. I'm going to use fade symmetrical. Then from the left and right menus, choose the type of fade curve you want to use. I'm going to select exponential. You can use the faders to customize the crossfade, of course. Once you're happy with your preset, go to the menus and select Set Global Crossfade. Now, whenever you split an object and pull the fade handle, the fade will be set to Symmetrical Exponential. If you want to globalize the crossfade width as well, pull the right crossfade handle to the desired amount. Then choose Set Global Crossfade again, and this setting will be added to the global setting. Now when I split an object, this setting is used as the default. If you make some changes to the crossfade and decide you want to revert back to that global setting, all you need to do is go to the menu and select Get Global Crossfade. This will restore your changes back to the global crossfade setting. So consider the phrase get global crossfade the same as restore or retrieve. The bottom tab is called pitch shifting time stretching. The main section of this window allows you to manipulate the pitch and time of audio objects in real time. The top control deals with pitch shifting and the bottom deals with time stretching. You can adjust the controls with either the mouse wheel or by clicking and dragging. Double clicking resets to zero. Double clicking again returns to the previous setting. It's also possible to change these values by using the up and down arrow on your computer keyboard. Holding down shift at the same time will adjust the values in smaller increments. Using the control modifier will move the values in semitones. In general, this is the way the modifiers work in Samplitude and Sequoia. Below the pitch shifting time stretching controls is the mode selection drop down list. The default mode is standard. If you hover your mouse, you should see a tooltip giving a description about the active algorithm. Left click on the downward arrow to select the one you want to use. When you move your mouse cursor over the name, an extended tooltip pops up. This gives you a detailed description about each mode. The following modes are available. Resample, Standard, Beat Marker Stretching Smooth, Smooth, Beat Marker Slicing, Beat Marker Stretching, Monophonic Voice, and also Universal HQ, which is the highest quality algorithm, although it does use more CPU power. If the extended tooltip is not showing, press Y and click on the General tab. Then make sure you have Show Extended Project Tooltips ticked. I won't be demonstrating all of these different algorithms in this tutorial, but as an example I'm going to use this vocal phrase to show you the possibilities. A night to remember. For this, I'm choosing the monophonic voice setting. It's a good idea to select the mode first, and then it will remain as the default for the selected object. Monophonic voice differs from the other algorithms in that it has a tick box which enables format correction to avoid the chipmunk effect. Now I'm going to change the pitch of this phrase in half step or semitone increments. A night to remember. A night to remember. A night to remember. A night to remember. If 
if I untick the format correction box, the difference is quite clear. To remember, and I to remember. Although some of you may prefer this effect if it suits your kind of music. As another example, if I split the object on the word to, I can adjust the pitch of that particular word very easily. And I to remember. And I to remember. And I to remember. And I to remember. This method is extremely useful for quickly retuning individual words without resorting to auto tuning. The fact that you can isolate and manipulate individual words in this way is another example of the power of the object editor. Another option, particularly for vocals, is to use Elastic Audio. To do this, tick the Use Elastic Audio Pitch Automation checkbox and then press the Elastic Audio button. You can have the window floating or docked if you press the Docked View button. The harmonizer can create extra voices using major or minor scales. And I to remember. And I to remember. Click cancel if you decide not to use the effect, or click OK if you want to keep it. I'm clicking OK. So now the object will play back the extra harmonies as well. And I to remember. To disable the harmonies, just untick the Use Elastic Audio checkbox and you'll be back to the original single line. And I to remember. You can, of course, use Elastic Audio for exaggerated retuning of vocals if your style of music requires that kind of effect. Click on the Detection button and then the Tune button. And I to remember. For an even more extreme effect, make sure you have the quantized drawing tool selected. You can use this to flatten out any vibrato and change the character of the sound completely. And I to remember. Then select a setting from the harmonizer and you're good to go. And I to remember. To remember. I won't be going into Elastic Audio in any greater detail as that would take too long and it's not within the scope of this tutorial. So that concludes the pitch shifting, time stretching section of the object editor. This final part deals with the object loop section. Notice the button labelled From Loop or Range. This can be used to find the tempo of an imported loop. As you can hear, the click and loop are completely off. To find the tempo, I'm going to do this. Select the loop, then go to the menu item, Range, Edit Range, Range over all selected objects. I've assigned my own hotkey for this. I suggest you do this as well as there is no default hotkey for this command and it's very useful. So now the range is sized to the exact length of the object. Next, click on the button From Loop or Range. Type in the number of beats. It's 8 in this case as it's a 2 bar loop. The tempo has now been detected as 125 BPM. To make this the project tempo, left click over BPM on the transport and select 125 from the list. If the tempo isn't in the list, double click and type it in. You can also change the BPM in the project options. After changing the tempo, the project tempo change window will automatically appear. In this case, I'm leaving both of the boxes unchecked. So now the tempo of the project matches the tempo of the loop. To make this a repeating loop, tick the Loop On checkbox. Now grab the bottom right handle of the object and pull it to the right. 
The loop will now repeat for as many times as you want. You may decide you want to use a smaller segment of the loop. To do this, click on the left arrow next to Loop End. This resizes the loop based on the current nudge step setting of one beat. You may also want to experiment with the loop start and loop length arrows as well. If you want to reverse the playback of audio objects, tick the reverse playback checkbox. So that concludes this final part of the guided tour of the object editor series. I hope you found it useful and thank you for watching.